Right, so in this video we're going to talk about the steady hand game and I'm going to try and present to you um, how the various components work together and what they do. Uh, what you can see on the screen at the moment is our printed circuit board and our printed circuit board is designed to help keep all of our wires and our cables as neat as possible and if you look at it, generally speaking with printed circuit boards we work in a straight line and where the gaps are that acts as an insulator, electrons can't flow, where the copper track is it acts as a conductor and the electrons can flow from the positive to the negative terminal of our power supply. In this case we're going to be working with either a 9 volt battery or a 5 volt supply and the electrons will flow from the positive to the negative through the copper on the PCB. Now we'll talk about how you make a PCB um, later on and we'll talk about um, sort of PCB production generally as a part of another video. We'll also talk about resistance values in detail in another vi video and how you calculate it. So this is really about the layout of the steady hand game. Okay, basic simple time delay circuit. So our, our fundamentally what I've got on that video on the screen to show you is the component. Next to the component is the circuit symbol that we would normally use um, when we were drawing out a circuit diagram. Um, and I've shortened the track and the follower uh, so that on a steady hand game, obviously those are much longer to make it more of a challenge. But for the for the purposes of this uh, presentation, we've got those a little bit smaller. Okay, so I'm going to go through component by component and just talk you through what each component will do. So if we start with the light emitting diode, now the light emitting diode is a really really important component in but any electronics almost, because where it's not being used as an actual light source, it's often used as a testing component or a signaling component to let you know that your circuit is working. So your LED, your light emitting diode, is uh, one of the most common components. In fact, all of the components that we use instead are really, really common ones. If you look at the circuit symbol, you can see it's the symbol for a diode, which only allows power to flow in one direction. It can't return the other way, but this one gives off light, and you can tell that by the two little arrows, which are showing off um, from the circuit symbol. There are two legs on an LED. It won't work, as I say, an, a, a, a diode will only work in one direction, so you have to get your LED the correct way around. There are two ways of telling that on an LED. You can either look for the long leg and the short leg, okay, where the, um, the short leg is the cathode, that's negative, the long leg is the anode, that's positive, or when you look at the green lens at the top on this one, um, Around the bottom there's a, there's a lip and actually there's a flat bit on it. It doesn't go all the way around, there's a flat part. That's another way of telling uh, which is your, your negative or to be connected to the negative side of your power supply. Okay. If you don't protect the LED from too much power, it will blow up. So although they're very, very cheap and they use very, very little power, they're quite easily damaged um, if you don't protect them within your circuit with things like a resistor. Okay. So cathode, negative anode positive, it needs a limiting resistor to protect it, very very cheap component, very little power consumption, excellent for signalling and basic illumination. Our next component is a little bit of a mysterious one um, because you don't really see what it does but it's a really important one. We're using it for a time delay. If you're using our, for our steady hand game circuit, or if you're triggering a, an alarm, you sometimes want that to stay on for a period of time so that you can see it, because electrons move very, very quickly. Um, so something can go on and off before the eye really registers it. So we're putting a small time delay in, and we're creating that time delay by using a capacitor. Now a capacitor, the name comes from its capacity, how much it can hold. A capacitor will collect and store um, a charge which it can then give off at a later point. So often when we're talking about um, the water analogy we talk about the capacitor as being like a bucket that can fill up with water. Now depending on the amount of water flowing into it and depending on the size of the capacitor or bucket it will take longer or shorter to fill. Okay now the same thing applies if we talk purely in capacitance for, ele uh, for electrons. Okay a larger capacitor will take longer to fill and it will hold more charge, which it can give off later on. We're using a 470 microfarad capacitor. Right Now there are a million microfarads in a um, farad. We use farads um, capacitors for maybe powering a motor just for, just for 
a little bit of time. Um, but generally speaking, when you see a capacitor, it's being used to just smooth out current, to make everything flow smoothly, or just give a small amount of a time delay, keeping a circuit on just for a very, very short period of time. Often they're used with a resistor to control exactly how much power comes out at a given time. For us, it's giving us about half a second time delay, 470 microfarad capacitor. You can see that on the body of the, um, the capacitor there. Um, the, the micro is indicated with the symbol. It looks a little bit like a, a back to front U, 470 microfarads. Um, again, it has to go, in this case, it has to go the correct way around. There are some which doesn't matter. In this case, we're looking at the positive being the long leg and the negative being the short leg. Okay, look at the circuit symbol. You'll notice how closely that resembles the symbol for a, um, a power cell that goes into a battery. Okay, electrolytic capacitor stores a small amount of charge. Okay, really important component now. We're going to talk about a resistor for a minute. We're using wire wound resistors. They're really, really cheap components but they're really cheap because they're made in such mass production quantities. If you look at any circuit board from wherever and, and whatever it does, whether it's controlling a, a rocket engine or it's controlling um, a one pound torch from the pound shop, uh, it's gonna have resistors in it. The resistors do two main jobs for us in this, in this particular case. They either guide the flow of electrons, so by making it a higher resistance, the electrons are gonna find a different path so that might mean guiding it to a different part of the circuit. Or what we also use these resistors for is to reduce the amount of power. If the, if the, um, if the electrons are going to go through the resistor, you can reduce the amount that pass over a period of time. Okay, you can reduce the current and the voltage by having a resistor in line. So we're actually using this resistor to protect our light emitting diode. Okay, now we're using, I'm, I'm looking at my values here, and we're using, in this case, a 470 ohm resistor. And I can tell that it's 470 because it's got a yellow, violet, and brown band running around the outside of it. I ignore the gold one, which is the one on the right. Okay, so I'm looking at the yellow, violet, and brown. It's four, seven, and zero, a single zero. We'll talk about how you calculate the value of a resistor later on. But I know from, from uh, building circuits that run between 9 volts, 6 volts and 5 volts that in line with most LEDs you're going to be using a 330 ohm or a 470 ohm resistor to prevent damage to that LED. Okay, it limits the amount of current. Okay, it can also be used sometimes to um, remember when we were talking about the capacitor, it can reduce the amount of charge that comes out of the capacitor um, so that might be useful if you were making something like an alarm circuit where you want the, the alarm to be activated for a little bit longer. Okay, so that's a wire wound resistor. Okay, so now we're onto the power supply. This is a nine volt battery. Now, when you're looking at power supplies, um, you want something which is going to be able to power your circuit. It's gonna last for a reasonable period of time. So we're using, in this case, a nine volt supply. Quite often we would plug into a five volt supply like a phone charger. If you look at most electrical sockets these days, they're powering very low voltage five volt supplies. That can be quite useful, okay? Now, a battery's great because it means that your product is portable. The downside of a battery is that if you leave it plugged in and the circuit activated, your battery's going to run out, okay? So when you're choosing your power supply, it's worth thinking about um, whether to use a battery or use a um, a, a connected low voltage supply. What you would never do with electronics, um, certainly at school level, is to plug into a mains supply because obviously that's very, very dangerous. We're working at low voltage. Um, voltage is the amount of pressure, the amount of push that gives you the amount of electrons flowing through. So if you've got low voltage, you're going to have correspondingly low current, low amps passing. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. Right, this is a push to make switch. Uh, now we're making our own switch. Now if you think about what I was talking about at the beginning, where our circuit board has connected copper track, which is a conductor, and that allows electrons to flow, and it has gaps, which are a printed circuit board, and that's a, a, a space which does not allow electrons to flow, it's an insulator. 
A switch works on the same basis. If you imagine it, I, I always talk about it being like a drawbridge on a castle, where when the drawbridge is up, nothing can pass. When the drawbridge is closed, things can pass along um, the drawbridge into the castle. So for a push to make switch, when the switch is closed, electrons pass. When the switch is open, no electrons can pass. Closed, okay, you've got an electron flow, you've got current. Open, you've got no electron flow, you've got no current. Okay. For us, we're not using an actual switch, we're making our switch by making the follower and the track, where if the two bits touch, that closes our circuit and allows electrons to pass. Okay. And there's our circuit. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit so you can see the various components. So we've got, there's our LED in place, there's our capacitor in place, our push to make switch and our power supply, okay? So you wouldn't normally see this copper track through it. What I've done is I've, I've allowed one to be seen through the other. That's actually on the opposite side. So I, would, I refer to that as the track side and the board side, okay? So where you've got this resin board, that's an insulator, no electrons can flow through it. Where you've got the copper track, that's a conductor and it's a good conductor, so electrons can pass through it. Um, we're talking about capacitance, how much the capacitor can hold. We're talking about resistance, that's ohms. Okay, that's how much we can control the flow of current or reduce the amount of power. We're talking about voltage coming from the battery. Okay, and we're talking about the electrons flowing around the circuit in whatever direction they flow in. Okay, we're talking about that as being current or amps, or in this case, milliamps, thousandths of an amp. Okay, so that's the steady hand game. Um, we'll talk about printed circuit board production in another video and we'll talk about how you read the different bands of a resistor in another video. Okay, but that's the basics. Hope that was quite useful.